I'm the founder and CEO of Tower Paddleboards, uh, Tower Electric Bikes, and I'm also the author of the uh, Five Hour Workday, which got published um, in 2015 and uh, got press in over 20 countries around the world. Um, today, on today's episode, you're going to listen to learn some interesting stuff. Um, you're going to learn about the power of constraints uh, and stuff we talk about in, in uh, my book, Five Hour Workday. You're going to learn about living in a world of monopolies and how to navigate that um, to not only drive revenues, but to drive profit. Um, we're also going to talk about the concept of one plus one equals 11 and why that's a, the critical uh, success factor in today's world. Um, and you also learn how to expand your view of innovation, um, especially um, if, you, if you, you're really having trouble innovating in this, in this uh, sort of environment today. And then lastly, um, you're going to learn uh, from my personal experience how to survive a $4 million haircut uh, in walking away from Amazon. And uh, there is life after Amazon in the direct to consumer world. Welcome back to our delicious conversation with Stephen Arstall. He's the guy that Mark Cuban singled out and said that was the best investment he ever did on Shark Tank. Uh, Jeff Bezos dropped his name to the annual stockholders meeting back in 2016, and he was named by two European newspapers as America's and the world's best boss. Uh, so those are pretty good things. We were talking about the, in part one, we talked about a little bit about his book, The Five Hour Workday. We're going to come back into a little bit more about that. We talked a lot about the revolution that is is happening. Um, who Amazon is versus who Amazon was and what is going to be the impact of that on your business moving forward. And that's what we want to talk about. You know, where are we really going in the context of dealing with these internet giants? Um, what does that mean for real business? Because uh, as Stephen was talking about in part one, it's one thing to generate revenue. It's a whole other thing to generate profit so that's where we're gonna we're gonna jump back in uh so let's let's start there Stephen. um you know you talked about this change in amazon from who it was to who it's become and you talked about doing something that was quite counterintuitive and, and gone back to direct to consumer but through a retail outlet um but still some of your sales are going through amazon because as you rightly pointed out Amazon is not a retail store. Amazon, and this I think most people miss this, is a convenience store. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who says, um, he was talking to me and he says, you know, people put a lot of hate on Amazon. He goes, I love Amazon. And, but he's in a different financial bracket. And he says, the reason I, I love Amazon is convenience. I don't have time. They get, they, the, I pay the extra sometimes because it's shipped to me right away. I don't have to go stand in Walmart or wherever it might be to try and get the thing. And, and one of the things that we know is the American consumer is driven by convenience. So there is that side of it. And as a result, you still do a percentage of your sales to Amazon, even though you're not relying on them. And as we talked about in part one, you walked away from a $4 million haircut with them. Talk to us about the ramifications first of, what was that like? I mean, that's a huge risk, man. I mean, four million, you're not exactly a, a forty billion dollar company go, oh, we'll take a four billion dollar haircut. You know, this was a massive percentage of your income. Talk to us about the impact of that initially. Yeah, and at the time we were about a seven and a half million dollar company. So uh it was I didn't I had never done this before. So <laughs> I, I sort of underestimated how difficult that would be uh, because it's hard to wind down your expenses so much. We we thought we were, you know, just wildly profitable, nothing could could shake us. But you know, a couple of years later, we were very close to uh, to bankruptcy or um, not really bankruptcy, but we had these loans out with uh, the banks. And the mm -hmm. banks really don't like you seeing you see you going from a seven point five million dollar company down to we were just over about a two million dollar company a couple of years later. Um, they do not like seeing that. And I'm like, look, we we walked away from Amazon. That was going to happen whether we wanted to or not. They were going to mm -hmm. put us out of business. I'm like, right. we intentionally did that. We diversified our business. We took all of those profits and we reinvested it into diversification. These are all the correct business, you know, approaches. And because of those, you know, we actually survived. Um, 
but coming into uh, this is funny because right at the end of two, 2019, one of our banks put like a million dollar line of credit in default, not because we didn't pay it, just because they didn't like our balance sheet. And I'm like, look, there is no problem here unless you guys create a problem as the bank and then you won't get paid back. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but, you know, banks are banks. And so they did that. And, you know, going into the, uh, the pandemic, I was just like, wow, this is, this is a problem. And, and we really sort of, you know, adjusted prices. We tightened thing. I got down to just me and two other people in this company. Right. And, um, and the pandemic hit and I thought it was all over. And basically, we we actually got away from the five hour workday. We were supposed to do. We were doing it every summer at that point. And we, I said, we can't afford to. We've got to fight for our lives. We ended up doubling revenues in 2020. Uh, got our loan, you know, taken out by sort of another bank, and you know, and now we're back and we doubled revenues. We were a little over four million, um, you know, in 2020. So, uh, so that was, you doubled revenues during the height of the pandemic. Yeah, with with no money too, because our banks had like restricted our our lines. We were just living on fumes, um, and some things. You know, we had an event space going into the pandemic too that we just put about three hundred thousand dollars into remodeling. <laughs> that went to zero overnight. So there were curveballs coming from everywhere. It's like sometimes as an entrepreneur, that's the way the world works, right? Um, you just you just got to feel this barrage. And um, if you're diversified, you know, some of the diversifications work. Our, our electric bike company, I mean, that grew like 500%. That is just going crazy, right? We're direct to consumer electric bikes, half price of bikes in retail. At the time, you would walk into a bike store. I don't know if this was the case in Canada, but um, there were no bikes in a bike store. <laughs> So, you know, we were facing that, you know, on the, uh, the electric bike side. And then the paddle boards did very well uh, as well, because it was, a, it was like a social distancing, um, you know, thing. So was the, you know, from a business point of view, was, this, was there a specific reason you decided to diversify into electric bikes, which is, you know, taking off like a rocket for you? Why did you choose them? Yeah, because, uh, and I, I, I touched on this in the other, uh, you know, part one of the podcast uh, podcast here, but um, you have to be able to admit you're wrong and you have to be able to admit that what you're doing now is not going to work in five years. And I had a company a long time ago, uh, I started in about 2003, 2004, um, which was selling high-end poker chips. And I thought I was going to retire in that company. And it, it was just this sort of it went up, it went up, it went up, and then it leveled out, and then it went down and down and down. And today it's 10% of what it was at the height. Um, that buypokerchips.com, you know, it was uh, named for the time. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, every product online and everything online becomes commoditized. So yes. that's just the, the way it goes. So paddle boards, you know, if, if you think, okay, we're brilliant. We have this paddle board company that's fastest growing, you know, company in San Diego, we can all retire. Nope, because that's going to go down too. So I almost think about diversification as I'm starting the existing business. <laughs> How am I going to diversify this out? So the idea with a paddleboard company was always to, uh, that was the tip of the spear. And we were kind of a larger beach lifestyle company. And we tried diversification into sunglasses. We tried it into regular uh, bikes. We tried it into surfboards. We tried it into snorkeling equipment. And, uh, and the electric bikes are really electric beach cruisers. Uh, so it fits our brand. And, you know, that's the first one that really hit in a big way. And we, we doubled down on that. We think that may even be bigger than our paddleboard company in not too long. You know, because that's, that's really, I mean, this is, it's a great point because it brings to mind this, you know, something that we're always hammering home, which is if you're doing what made you successful today, if you're doing what you made you successful yesterday, you're out of business tomorrow. And, you know, you, you've got these paddle boards, which has become a massive sport, um, but you've made them in a different way. They're not hard. They're, you know, they're, they're completely different. But as you said, you know, we, we saw this. Um, I'm old enough to remember when Japan started knocking off stuff, right? Um, I remember when, you know, um, they were the best at, at nicking an idea and changing it and doing something to it and producing it cheaper. Now China's that company, uh, that country. Um, and, you know, if you sell something online, somebody's going to buy it and go, how can I re make this for less and make a profit? And of course, that if you're selling it, that's what's going to happen. 
you seem to have known that you seem to have understood that which will happen with the bikes and it will happen with anything you produce because you talked about commoditization and in a uh, in the in the democratization of the economy you also therefore going to get the democratization of your ip is going to get nicked and turned into somebody else's product how do you stay ahead of that because it feels like it must I, I, it would be easy to feel like they're ripping me off i think a lot of people would feel that way about it yeah, I mean, this, there's an interesting saying inside Amazon, these, these brands go to them, and I want to put my brand on Amazon, and they're like, you don't have a brand, you have a price. <laughs> this is Amazon's take. If you had a brand, you wouldn't need us. Um, and that is exactly true. So what you have to think about, and it's interesting, you talked about your friend that uh, you started the hard copy magazine. Now, mm -hmm. you have to really go back to business basics, and a lot of things are going to completely change. Like if the world is this monopolistic space and everything is a commodity, how do you stand out as a brand in that world? Um, and so really that's what we're trying to do at Tower Paddleboards and Tower Electric Bikes is we're getting our costs super low. So we don't have to sell. We don't have to be the, sell the most bikes in the world or you know, do the most advertising or anything. We have to survive 20 years and build a brand, old school, build an authentic brand, you know, one customer at a time. And there's a way to do that. You just keep your costs low. You know, you don't need this, this, this massive company to do this. And I think that is the key to survival right now. And then also part of keeping your costs low is you diversify. Like we, we operate our paddleboard company and our e-bike company out of, and now an e-bike repair shop here in San Diego, where we work on any electric bike out of one warehouse. So that divides our cost among several businesses. We mm -hmm. office out of a, uh, a beach club that we rent out for weddings. So instead of paying rent, we collect rent. So we have like negative expenses, you know, in our mm -hmm. officing. So you have to get creative like that, just like any other brand did. A brand that survived 30 or 40 years in today's world, um, they, you know, figured out how to survive through several, you know, iterations of retail because retail changed before Amazon. You know, there was the, the, the Walmartification, the big box stores. You know, yeah. and it will change again. I mean, one of the companies, and you, you also talked in here, which was very sort of poignantly about um, the idea of doing what you're doing now, but also working on the future. And that's exactly yeah. what we do in, in, in our companies. So we have sort of our four basic business units, but we have the future, which is this no middleman.com, which is this aggregate. It doesn't make any money for us. It's just a content site. We're just building it. We built it a couple of years ago. It sits there. It gets five or 10,000 people coming into it a month. We don't pay anything for that. It's a information service for consumers and it aggregates all of the direct to consumer brands and list their products. And then you go in there, find your product and then go right to them. It's a search engine for products, which is essentially right. kind of what Amazon is today. Yeah. Um, but this is something that allows those small players to survive. And I think something like that is the future of retail. It's where these you know, I got this organic brand that I'm building over 30 years and I pair up with another brand that's doing that. And we pair up with a third brand and a, and a fourth brand. And we all throw in together, instead of paying Amazon or Google half of our revenue, we say, I'll send you customers, you send me customers. And I'm not going to charge you anything for that. That's in, how you do it. In my book, uh, Fiercely Loyal, one of the things I talked about was um, that the future of business is is you have to forget competition and you have to embrace collaboration. Yeah. And I talked about it exactly the way you just did, right? You've got to look at the people you think are your competitors and say, how can we collaborate? Because that's the only way you're going to be able to stand up to the big boys is yeah. if you stop competing with the other little boys and go, hold on, we could be big boys too. If we come together as a united force and, I love that you you've decided to do that um, because it's your brand that stands out, not the product uh, or the price, but the brand. And it's like, well, I really like Tower as a beach brand, and I really you know, because that's what we have. That's the emotional connection. And as you said, there are people who are always going to be price focused. But when it comes to a brand, people are not generally price focused. They're more focused on, I want to make sure it's my brand. So yeah. I, I love that you're taking that, that head on. 
and embracing bringing other people into it. And it's interesting. So in the space that I work in is um, it's the internet space. And that's where I've been since 1999. So the last 20, 22 years. Um, and most of the people in that space, they didn't go to college to learn about internet marketing or e-commerce or something like that. They learned it on the ground, right? Yeah. And a lot of these people have some kind of their internet marketers and they've got some hack, but they don't actually have a business background. So they don't understand the branding. They understand, oh, I, f I found out how to do Facebook advertising and I got this hack and I can steal emails from here and I can spam these people or whatever, but they really don't have the two sides of it. And kind of like a CTO in a tech company, if you have somebody that has like an, an engineering degree and a business degree, mm -hmm. that one plus one equals 11. And yes. this is what's becoming more and more critical. I think in the business world, you can't just have these internet sort of marketing hacks and call yourself a business person. If you want to be a business person, you've got to have sort of that business fundamentals. You should be reading business books, not marketing hacking, you know, internet hacking uh, books, kind of like, kind of like in the tech world. And that's how you become the one plus one equals 11. And I think I just, I came out of grad school in 99 with an MBA and just got thrown into the internet world. So I had those two things the whole time. So I always looked at these businesses as, okay, here's a marketing hack, uh, but what are the business fundament fundamentals you know, behind mm. this? So as you sort of look forward to, you know, you know let's, let's look at big sort of Fortune 500 organizations. What do you see as the writing on the wall that they're not paying attention to? Do you see... Is there anything that sort of stands out to you that they're saying, well, we're too big? Um, you know, I, when, when I was with the radiology company a long time ago, the internet company, we got bought by Eastman Kodak, right? And then uh, Eastman Kodak, you know, famously sort of oh, yeah. went out of business or, you know, completely collapsed. But we were a startup and we were this high growth company and they saw this and they wanted to have an internet company. So they bought us for probably overpaid for us and then started running us for cash flow, right? And they would fly the private jet out and have a meeting with us and you know talk to us. And I'm like, I was the business development guy in this company. And they're like, well, you guys aren't making money here. You aren't doing that. And I'm like, you are worried about making money in the wrong part of your business. In my business, you know, today, I don't really I compare this to Kodak, but I'm saying we have the paddleboard business, which is our cash cow, right? I run that for profitability. Everything else we run for growth. You can lose money in those, you know, you want to pour fuel on the fire. So you really have to break your business down as a fortune 500 company and say, what businesses are we hanging on to? And we're probably going to be disrupted in, in the next 10 years. Okay. And run those for cash. Fine. Um, but then the ones that you actually have the chance to, you know, create sort of a new paradigm or something like that, you need to like 10 X your investment there. So take all of your investment out of this. Like when I started the a paddleboard company, I had the poker chip company, I told you. Yeah. I, I took and I had no money, right? And we had, I don't know, maybe $50,000, $80,000 in income or something like that. I took like thirty dollars or $40,000 in income, my most popular poker chip line, and I killed it. I took that money and started a paddleboard company because I knew it was just getting disrupted. Um, we walked away from Amazon. We killed that part of the business and we invested that money elsewhere. So you have to do, and it's so hard to do that because- mm -hmm. It doesn't look good, especially on, I mean, these, I feel sorry for these, these Fortune 500 companies that have to manage from, you know, quarter to quarter and stockholder expectations. Who's doing well in that world? Why is the stock market doing well right now? It's because of, you know, the Jeff Bezos of the world who sort of told his stock or stockholders to, to fly a kite for 20 years and we're not going to make you money. And they just lost money and lost money and lost money. And, he, and even today, he doesn't pay any tax because he takes all the profit from these and he invests in these new ones, right? And so that's how these, these companies, you've got to think and you've, you've got to be almost like crazy about it. That's, that's a really interesting insight. So from your point of view, you know, was, you know I, I have often said, particularly in the entrepreneurial space, that there's this imaginary line from where you start to where you are. And this imaginary line, everybody in the outside sees it as direct. <laughs> sure. um, and of course, it never is. Um, and oftentimes, it's a turning point. It, it's a 
something happens that makes you go, uh, I got to rethink everything. And oftentimes that's a life choice, by the way. It's not even a business choice, but it impacts business. And sometimes it's a business choice. What was the turning point for you? What was the moment when you realized the path I'm on is not my path? I got to get off. I got to do something else. Yeah, I, I think that was really when we downsized the business, um, you know, from getting off of Amazon. And then we had that sort of brush with death. And that brush with death was at the hands of a bank. And it was at the hands of a bank that I was paying my loan on time. Um, but because in the contract somewhere, they wanted our certain ratios, this, they wanted, they were uncomfortable, so they could shut us down. And I was like, you know, Jesus, I really didn't need to go get that money from the bank. I mean, we did, we couldn't get financing as a startup the first four or five years, and we were the fastest growing company in San Diego. You make different decisions. Then a bank comes to you and says, hey, here, would you like a half a million dollars? And then a year later, they said, would you like a million and a half dollars? I mean, I was even uncomfortable with these amounts, but I'm like, Phew. I took them. I'm an entrepreneur, right? I'm like, I don't got to raise money. I'm going to use bank money, highly leverage myself and grow with that. But it put me in a position where other people sort of had control of the future. And if some downturn happened, they could put me out of business for non-logical reasons, right? Um, and it really made me sort of reassess like using bank money and putting yourself in that position. Um, just, just say, well, we won't grow then if we don't have the money to grow. And I think sometimes... Uh, you got to do that. So I've really sort of adjusted that. And the, the whole idea of, you know, like these 15 year, like overnight success that you see in people, I really think the reason for that is that, you know, the first hundred thousand is hard and the first million is harder. And then the next 10 million, it just gets easier and easier because you have a base to survive with. This is really what, you know, in, in your audience, the fortune 500, you know, CEOs, the advantage they have that I think they don't necessarily realize how big their advantage is, is in my business, I'm diversifying, you know, I've got an event space, I've got the e-bikes, I've got the paddle boards, I've got a repair shop, I'm building the future in nominalman.com. And, you know, I have to like take the, take my eye off this ball because we just have to survive here, right? And so I'm doing, you know, cartwheels here just to survive. And if I get a little extra money, I'll invest, right? Like mm -hmm. that's, that's the benefit of having public uh, money, being in the public markets or whatever, is you can, um, you don't have any constraints. So build constraints in there, but you have this money. You don't have to worry about survival. You can do these investments without worrying about survival on the other side. You have to worry about whether this looks good or bad to your stockholders, but you don't really have to worry about survival. And I have to worry about payroll and stuff like that. So I think that's... Um, but, you know, as, as Bob Dylan said, everybody has to serve somebody. Uh, and, you know, I think that, you know, when you, you're the Fortune 500 CEO, you've got to serve the, you know, you've got to serve the board who are serving the stockholders or the shareholders, et cetera. Um, and, you know, you, uh, you might be serving a bank if you're a smaller entrepreneur or, um, you know, your original investors or whatever it might be. Uh, that level of autonomy is extraordinarily rare. Um, and, you know, I do see people, you know, we were all going after the investment dollars for a while. And then people started to realize, oh, this comes with a lot of um, constraints that are not my own or that sure. are not even, it's, it's one thing to say the constraints are not my own, but they're not even aligned with my values. That's the difficult part. You know, so yours were this silly bank thing around, you know, we don't like your numbers, even though they make sense. Um, is there a way around that, do you think? I mean, you you should, and sort of Cuban, you know, Cuban's my business partner in this. He's a 30% owner of all these companies based on the yeah. Shark Tank deal. And he is always like, you know, taking on money, you're not getting money, you're getting an obligation you know, to pay me this money back. Cuban invested 150,000. Uh, the reason we're one of his best investments, we've cashed him out over a million dollars in dividends already. And he still, you know, has his 30% of the company. Um, but he's kind of of that opinion. And I was like, that's easy to say, you know, like if you're a billionaire, you already got the money, sure. right? But it, there, there are ways to do it without money. 
And so what you should do is just put all the, all the things in two, two columns, you know, one that requires money and one that does not require money. And then scratch out that first column and then go after the second column. And you can build businesses that way. It's, it's, um, it's a little harder in some respects, but like you said, um, you you don't have those constraints or other differing opinions running the business. So, <clears throat> you know, I certainly can run this business without bank financing. We had to do that during the pandemic and we doubled revenues, um, right. you know, so, and it just makes you make different decisions. Some of those decisions are probably better because there are uh, constraints on there. So it's, right. it's a tough question, but one, uh, of I mean, course. That's, what the, that's what the CEOs get paid for, right? <laughs> so, you know, you know, I talked about at the beginning that I, th I and it's part of my advice to people that, you know, I'll say, you know, uh, think about Blockbuster TV, uh, Blockbuster Video and Netflix was, you know, consumed them and they had an opportunity to buy out. Netflix didn't do it. And, you know, who the hell's got a net, how, who the hell's got a Blockbuster store now? No one. So. And I would say to people back in, you know, even in the day, I said, who is the Netflix of your industry? And now it's who is the Amazon of your industry, right? And Amazon may be the Amazon of your industry. Um, what do you see as the kinds of disruptions to daily life and business coming in the next two to five to 10 years? Because you, you are clearly thinking about those things. What, what, do, what do we need to brace for? And what do we need to... Uh, set ourselves up for. Yeah. So the the interesting thing about uh, the Netflix example is where Netflix innovated is not what people usually think of as innovation, right? Like they didn't change the movie making business. They didn't do that. They changed distribution, yes. right? And everybody, every you know, want to be entrepreneur wants to invent some product and you know sell it, innovate. Oh, how do we make this widget better? How do we do this better? There's a lot of ways to innovate, right? You can innovate on the marketing. You can, uh, you know, not advertise and use, you know, search engine optimization. You can innovate on the distribution like Tower Paddleboard did with going direct to consumer. Um, you know, you can innovate in different ways. Everybody, Tesla is this huge, you know, valuable company. Did they, did they introduce the electric car or did they basically take dealerships out of the mix? They took cars direct to consumer. Nobody ever talks about that, right? No. Like that's what they changed. Right. And uh, it's a lot more profitable to do that, right? Like dealerships. We're sort of an old thing. So I think you really need to think about, um, you know, look at the companies that are really successful and where are they, um, you know, where are they innovating? And it's not always just on the, the product. Um, there's a lot more room for innovation in the, the distribution, uh, in the marketing, um, in those types of areas. Um, that's why I, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, in the direct to consumer world, there was this big thing, you know, we started in 2010, the same time as Warby Parker started, Bonobos was a few years before that, this was sort of the dawn of, you know, the direct to consumer or people calling it that, like, I didn't even know I had a direct to consumer paddleboard company, right. I just had no distribution. And this is what right. we did. And they were half priced because of that. And then it became sexy to say you were direct to consumer. And then people started raising hundreds of millions of dollars in direct to consumer, blowing all that money and flaming out. And now everybody is like, well, direct to consumer doesn't work. That was a, that was a falsity. Instead of paying retailers of 50%, they just spent 50% on the advertising. So everybody like given up on direct to, direct to consumer retail. I'm long on direct to consumer retail because mm -hmm. I believe if I can sell a product for half price on the internet and everybody is one click away from that, they'll find it. Sure. You know, we live in a very transparent world. I don't care how much power Amazon has. I mean, I price my products 30% more on Amazon and people, you know, don't even jump to my website. So take advantage of them, treat them like sure. a convenience store, charge twice the price over there. So people will buy it, but they'll eventually find you. And I think people are going to, you know, like you said, your buddy, you know, he loves Amazon because it's convenient. I love Amazon because it's convenient. Both of us are probably very price insensitive. Mm -hmm. The you know, the, the rules of uh, the laws of economics do not disappear overnight because some people are price insensitive on, on a measure. Like if you have a lower price, the same product, people are going to find you if it's transparent to do that. So that's kind of what I think is, um, you know, that's where the world is going. Like you can't just have a product and be the best at marketing and have your product be sort of half-assed and it's going to work. No. So the basis of marketing is your product, is your value proposition. 
fix that. You know, don't worry about your marketing because the world is getting more and more transparent, especially as we go to AI. They're not going to say, nobody's going to Google paddleboard. They're just going to tell me, just tell me what the top three paddleboard brands in the world are. And there will be top three paddleboards by quality or value proposition. And everybody is going to know it because we live in this artificially intelligent world. So as a corporation think, you know, are we sort of marketing BS company? Or are, do we really have the, the best value proposition and, and, and we just got to get the word out there because the word is going to get out there. So focus on the, the product and focus on the value proposition. Fabulous. I think that's a good world to live in too. Yeah, I think it's very insightful. So taking that just to sort of, as we come to the end of the show here, um, <clears throat> I would like for you to give us um, a little bit of practical guidance in the context of, because um, we've talked a lot about many of the different aspects of this, which have been wonderful. Um, but the, the four hour work, uh, the five hour work day, sorry, the five hour work day. What's your best practical guidance around that uh, for our listener who was thinking, you know, I like the idea of this. Is it an experiment? Is it real? Is it pie in the sky? What would be your practical guidance around that? I mean, I want people to go read the book and get the, yeah. the idea themselves, but I want them to have a sense of, all right, well, I could go try this tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, the big thing is in the, um, the knowledge worker world, like if you can hire the best people, the smartest people, you're going, your company's going to thrive. How do you get those? You can, you can either pay them a ton of money um, or you can give them a, a better you can renegotiate with labor. And that's all we did with the five hour work. If that's what it was about, it was trying to attract the best workers and retain those best workers. We did an experiment for two years. Um, some things didn't work. Um, you know, we tend to hire young people, but I don't think it really attracted and retained people because we had people like leave, you know, we had, you know, when we got away from it, we had four of the nine people in our company leave within 90 days. They had a five hour work day. Uh, they were young kids. They were making good money in sort of a, a fun, sexy company to be in. And I'm like, this is insane. They didn't care. They didn't care. They wanted alignment with whatever the company was doing. That's why they were coming to our company. It was not because of the five-hour workday. It was not because of how much I paid them. Like, I was shocked by that because that was the original intent of it. So that, you know, didn't work so well with the five-hour workday. Um, but what did work well is compressing people for time. And, and creating sort of a productivity focused environment and an environment that looked for productivity tools. So I think any company could benefit from doing a five hour workday test. You just say this summer, we're gonna do this for three months, 8, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. You gotta get out of there. You're gonna be fired if you're not as, as productive as you were before. In the office though, I'm not long on remote work uh, because I think the whole point of a company is you get a bunch of smart people together, you put them in a room, and you have them bounce ideas off of each other. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you go to remote, you lose that. I don't mm -hmm. think worker productivity goes down. I think individual worker productivity probably goes up, like you, you, you mentioned the stats, but yep. your collective, there's a reason that cities thrive in the world. There's because a bunch of smart people live in a certain area and they sort of rub elbows and they talk over coffee and drinks and uh, productivity happens and imagination happens. Um, you need that in a company. So I say, bring your workers into, into the office, get them to work five hour work day, but, or get them to work eight, eight, together. Uh, but if you do sort of a summer um, efficiency training, and then in the fall, go back to like regular hours, what you'll be doing is you'll be giving, you know, your workers their life back. They'll appreciate that. And they'll say, man, if we do a good job of this, maybe this will continue. And they'll all train themselves to work at twice the speed because they'll identify the, the, the free and cheap productivity tools that are out there. You don't have to bring in consultants or productivity experts. Just say, you know your job, you've got less time to do it, figure it out. Fabulous. I really enjoyed the conversation, Stephen. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, Thank you, you for please, having me on. Yeah, it's our, our pleasure and our honor. Please tell our, our viewers, our listeners, where they can find out more about you, uh, about the boards, about the book, of course, and where they can get that. And any other ways that they can get in touch or, or find out more about what it is that you offer? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm pretty easy to find. We're a small company, so all the contact information is on our website. So uh, towerpaddleboards.com, towerelectricbikes.com. Uh, you can go to nomiddleman.com. 
you know, our social media, we're not huge into social, but, um, you know, at Tower Beach Club, that's kind of our, you know, the overarching thing for all of our uh, different divisions. Um, and then the book, Five Hour Workday, you can get that on Amazon, of course. They're good at selling books. We still sell it through there. <laughs> <laughs> or if you buy a paddleboard or an e-bike, we send a book in the package. <laughs> good. So buy a bike, buy a paddleboard, get a book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Stephen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being with us. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders. You can chat about today's episode that you've been listening to or any of our past episodes inside of our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. By the way, we got a little uh, big surprise. Well, yeah, we got a big surprise coming up for you pretty soon. Keep your ears open. There's some, something very cool happening. The truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working at a fraction of your true capability. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or leadership strategist for yourself or your organization, go to dovbaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. Because unified, actualized meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for all individuals and for companies. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can confront your own biases, discover how you are already wrong, embrace a five hour workday, and stay profitable while growing your income. I'm Dolph Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. Mm -hmm.